Celestine Gregerson is next. She is actually one of our uh, U of U students here today, so I'll turn the time over to her. I'm excited to be speaking this morning on this interesting case that was seen here in Pediatric Ophthalmology Clinic. Um, this patient initially presented in 2017. She was two months old at the time. She was referred to us by an outside pediatric ophthalmologist who was requesting a second opinion on a possible cataract in the right eye. Past medical history was non-contributory. Um, she was born at term, via C-section, no complications. Mom had hypertension and gestational diabetes during pregnancy. There was no family history of congenital cataracts, and mom had reported that the patient was behaving normally up until this point. On exam, bilateral cataracts were seen. Shown here, you can see the posterior, there's posterior vacuolite collections that um, on the right side are located peripherally and encroaching somewhat centrally, and then on the left side, they're located peripherally. The retinoscopic reflect was not, was not distorted in either eye. And interestingly enough, there was a surprisingly high amount of myopia found in both eyes of about minus five. Exam was otherwise unremarkable. Um, the idea of lab testing at this time was considered, but given the lack of retinoscopic reflex distortion, it was decided to just watch closely. So taking a brief moment here to consider the differential diagnosis for bilateral congenital cataracts, which is quite broad. Um, in our patient, we were considering non-syndromic and syndromic genetic causes, also metabolic causes. Congenital infection was on our differential, and then also, given the posterior location, a pre-existing posterior capsular defect was possible. Three weeks later, the patient returned, and the cataracts, as you can see, had, had progressed um, bilaterally. Lab work was ordered at this time, including a BMP, calcium, phosphorus, um, red cell galactose 1-phosphate, and uh, congenital workup. Some of the results are shown here. Um, they were significant for an elevation in galactose 1-phosphate and elevation in HSV and rubella titers. Given this elevation in galactose 1-phosphate, um, the geneticist that was helping us on this case uh, recommended that we pursue further testing for galactokinase deficiency and um, galactosemia. Just a brief biochemistry refresher. Uh, lactose, which is um, taken in through our diet, is broken down into glucose and galactose, and then galactose is metabolized via this pathway. Um, these two enzymes, GALT and GOC, are the ones that are implicated in um, galactosemia and galactokinase deficiency. GALT is the one that is seen in class, uh, is deficient in classic galactosemia. And then galactokinase acts here. I, the deficiencies in either enzyme can result in accumulation of galactose, which is then reduced to galactosol, which deposits in the cataract, or in the lenses. Um, the decision was actually, at this, at this time, kind of considering this pathway, um, we discussed the possibility with mom of trying to eliminate milk from the patient's diet. And um, mom was interested in this option, so she decided to switch the, the patient to a completely soy-based formula. And two weeks on this formula, you can see there's actually a regression in the cataract, especially in the right eye. However, the patient actually tested negative for galactose kinase deficiency and galactosemia, um, which is a little bit of a puzzle. The option to dis discontinue soy formula was discussed at this time, but mom was encouraged by the, the regression in the, the right cataract, so she decided to continue soy formula. And the patient was scheduled to see a geneticist and for further genetic testing a few months out. Meanwhile, she continued to follow up with us. And um, in the following images, you can see the change in her cataracts that occurred in the following year and a half. So here, actually, um, I don't know if you can appreciate that on the right side, the cataract did regress mildly. Left side remained stable. And then this was earlier this year. Um, here's a side-by-side -side comparison. <coughs> This idea of reversible cataracts has actually been pretty rarely described. Um, in galactosemia and galactokinase deficiency, you can sometimes see a regression cataracts if lactose is eliminated from the diet early on. Uh, patients with galactosemia typically have this uh, oil droplet cataract with posterior lenticonus, which our patient didn't have. Um, and so, we were interested to see the results of the genetic testing. She tested positive for a pathogenic variant of the MAF gene. And now MAF is a transcription factor that has a lot of different functions, but it's 
embryonically, it uh, functions to help with lens fiber cell development, and um, it is associated with congenital cataracts, and it's also associated with the syndrome Omigrip syndrome. So our patient actually received a tentative diagnosis of Omigrip syndrome. This syndrome is a rare autosomal dominant syndrome that um, is has a prevalence worldwide of about less than one in a million. It has this clinically homogeneous phenotype that um, is outlined here, and as you can see, it manifests systemically. The cataracts in this syndrome have not previously been described as reversible, and typically the cataracts are actually a posterior oil drop of cataract with um, posterior lenticonus, similar to the galactokinase, um, or galactosemia cataract. So um, on further investigation, our patient was actually found to be heter um, heterogeneous for a for a complete lesion, um, expanding the entire coding sequence for the MAF protein. This is in contrast to the single nucleotide variants that are exclusively described in, or I should say in Omigrip syndromes, is they are exclusively described to have these single nucleotide variants. And of course, the cataract that I showed you earlier in our patient was quite different from the characteristic cataract of Omigrip syndrome. Additionally, our patient, as she continued to develop, did not have any of these physical characteristics um, and she was meeting milestones, so really didn't match the Omigrip syndrome diagnosis. So we have this kind of um, dichotomy between clinical phenotype and genotype. Given the lack of syndromic features in our patient, it's possible that a um, deletion of the complete coding sequence of the MAF protein is actually less damaging than a missense mutation that you would have in Omigrip syndrome, and perhaps the missense mutation has kind of a dominant negative effect in Omigrip syndrome. So just a few points to consider. This case actually remains a little bit of a mystery. If we're to kind of focus, follow an Occam's razor approach, the cataracts regressed with milk elimination, we could assume that this was a galactokinase deficiency and maybe an atypical presentation. Um, but something to remember is that we don't know for certain that there's actually a causation or even a correlation relationship. It's possible that this was just a coincidence in timing and the cataracts sort of reversed on their own anyways. Um, in recent years, we've seen this transition from predominantly infectious workup to a genetic workup, and that poses some challenges because, as you can see illustrated in this case, sometimes what, what do we do when the, the um, genotype doesn't actually fit the clinical picture? And then also, what do we do with the genetic information that we, that we gain, such as a, a complete deletion of the coding sequence of the MAF protein, um, that we don't really know what the significance is. So. Um, that's another question that we want to consider. And then I think this case also begs the question, should we be doing genetic testing for isolated congenital cataracts? This study um, that I've cited here at the bottom in Australia, they, they found that in pediatric patients that didn't have any syndromic features, it actually was very unhelpful to perform this genetic testing because their pretest probability was already so low. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your attention and your time, and um, thank these individuals for the help with my presentation. Thank you.